angam pangalya nunggulang berat. Where is your clan territory? My clan territory? I don't know what he means. Uh, from sunrise or sunset? From sunrise. From South America. I was born there. Why is he so interested in my, my mother's grandfather? He's interested in you. Ira juga apa? Ira pula kajama urung wanyua, urung ranyua, aku warnu kanyua. We nothing but the law we learn from our forefathers. But surely men are more important than laws. No. The law is more important than just man. You are listening to TMB DOS. They must be destroyed on sight. The following podcast may contain language and discussions of a frank and adult nature, and spoilers regarding the films discussed are always to be expected. Thank you for joining us. Now start the show, Dr. Rausch. They must be destroyed on sight! Okay, we're back, and it is episode 141 of They Must Be Destroyed on Sight. I'm your host, Lee. Sometimes I speak English, sometimes I don't rustle, and I'm joined by my co-host, Daniel. More real than reality itself, Harper. How are you doing, sir? <laughs> I'm having a nightmare about a giant wave. Does that... Uh... Oh, yeah. is, it, is this like a giant wave at like a football stadium, or is this like, like an actual physical wave of water? I, I don't know that I can distinguish between the two, basically. I think that there are just different ways of perceiving things that, uh, you know, maybe one, maybe the other. And uh, we, with our European uh, limited knowledge, may not have that proper understanding. It might, it might be so. It might be so. We, uh, we've, we've, forgotten, we've forgotten what dreams are about. So, we have. We have, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, something that was requested a long time ago. Uh, we're finally getting to it. It is The Last Wave from 1977, and uh, that should be a fun discussion. But before we get into that, we do have a couple comments here uh, from our YouTube versions of our show. Which always bodes well. Yeah. <laughs> One's good and one is bad. So, uh, All right, so Well, let's hit, hit me with them. Okay. So someone called JW posted on our Violent City review uh were you reading the names with your eyes shut lena wertmuller no d michael constantine no mitchell heaven knows how you how else you butchered names so I mean, you, to, be, to be fair you do butcher names uh-huh. but i think that's i think that's part of the charm of this podcast yeah and i think i got them right this time so fuck you jw <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, really. Uh, um, some, sometimes I mean, I I mean do... the, the idea that someone—it just amazes me that like that's the comment people leave on. You know, yeah, I'm reading. I, I'm watching. A, I'm watching a YouTube video, which is a podcast review of a movie from 1975, and the host reads the names in the cast slightly incorrectly, and then ah, you know, throw up my hands. I can't bother to listen to this anymore because clearly you're just a bunch of ignorant fucks. Yeah, and I mean, I I admit right off the bat that I'm bad at reading foreign names, and I tend to skirt through the cast really quickly, too, so I tend to stumble even more and fuck up. So, you know, if that's a big problem for your podcast listening, then well, I don't know what the fuck you're doing with podcasts, because I've heard a lot of other podcasters do way worse than me. Let's just put it that way. So, uh, fuck you, JW. And then we have a comment from someone called Kelpie on our Blast of Silence episode saying... Thanks for posting this fairly intelligent, thoughtful discussion of this really great film, distinguished by so many excellent aspects, including the second person narration. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. A fairly intelligent. That's probably the nicest thing anybody's ever said about us. Yeah. You don't sound like total fuckheads. 
but maybe we didn't have any European names to uh, mispronounce in that one. So maybe I that's, think that's uh, what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's the, yeah, no, I get it. <laughs> so yeah, we'll we'll move on now, and uh, this is fun. So you you guys are familiar if you've been listening for a while now that every once in a while we do the movie god game, where we pick two people, two direct, you know, two directors, two writers, two. S- soundtrack makers fucking and anything that's related to movies and we have to erase one of them from the timeline basically so everything they've done does not exist i was sort of surfing around twitter the other day and i saw this from someone called dj kaiser uh, i have no idea who this person is but uh, they posed this question and this is pretty insidious. This is sort of a variation on this sort of uh, movie god aspect and the question here is Resurrect one, the rest get their filmographies deleted. And he lists four directors here, Orson Welles, Stanley Kubrick, Alfred Hitchcock, and Akira Kurosawa. First first off, uh, how did you interpret this, Daniel? Do you interpret this as just the movies they directed or stuff they acted in? Uh, I would say filmography. I mean, I would sort of interpret it as direct, uh, you know, I mean, they're sort of being treated as directors. Mm-hmm. And I guess really only Wells really had a significant sort of uh, acting career outside of the things he directed. Right. Um, I mean, I guess you count Alfred Hitchcock's uh, like TV work and such. But, you know, I interpret it less about because in Movie God, what we're trying to do is to kind of look at the way film history changes. If you sort of delete stuff from the timeline, mm-hmm. this looks a little bit more like we delete every copy of this stuff, you know, like so we can't get to watch it again. But it still sort of exists in history. Hmm. But you get to bring somebody back to life. That's how I'm kind of interpreting okay. this. Um, I, I've seen I've seen some of this sort of thing happening on Twitter, where it's kind of just more about like it's about kind of causing pain, but it's more sort of a personal pain, you know, of like you've got to you know never get to watch any of this again. But okay. we're going to give you like something positive to sort of you know, and usually it's you know one of four Marvel movies or something like that. You know? Oh, okay. Like, you know, so um, you know, it, it's kind of it's kind of a meme that's been going around low key on kind of movie Twitter and you know pop culture Twitter. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to go with that interpretation of this, and that makes me feel better about when I do give my answer. But I'm going to let you. I go mean, first. I mean, and this one also allows us to we have to delete three of the four. Mm-hmm. You know, and basically, pick any one of those. You know, any any version of this is going to radically reshape you know the entire history of cinema. Since you know uh, the the well, God, really the the late twenties. If you if you get rid of Hitchcock, you know. So yeah, but but as as you are saying <sighs> your uh, interpretation of this, though we're not erasing them from the timeline. We're just destroying. All right, we're just we're just you we don't you don't get to ever watch it. it again. You don't get to ever watch it again. Yeah, and we just have them all by but in in terms of like lost you know films or whatever. <laughs> And in that case, you know, I also kind of look at this as, you know, you get to resurrect somebody, which means you get to kind of bring somebody into the modern era and they get to kind of make films again. And that definitely influences my decision because I feel like, you know, Hitchcock had a perfectly fine career. Kurosawa, you know, he had some ups and downs in his career, but he definitely kind of got to make the films he wanted to make to a large degree. Ditto Kubrick. I mean, Kubrick was kind of petering out towards the end, and I, that seems to be sort of a personal decision. I mean, he only made three films past 1980, so, you mm-hmm. know, like, you know, um, it's kind of hard to think, like, well, you know, this is clearly somebody who had, who was, you know, kind of in the prime of his, his career. I mean, he kind of said what he wanted to say. And in that case, I think Wells is the obvious choice to, to resurrect, to bring back, because he's the one guy who really, I mean, he got a real sweetheart deal on Kane which then it's into Ambersons. And then he kind of made some some stuff kind of around that period. But Wells had this problem. He really liked making films, but he really hated finishing films. <laughs> he would kind of get distracted by some new project constantly, and uh, the studios very quickly got tired of that. And uh, he, he ends up kind of like losing his uh, kind of wonderkin status and then spends most of his life kind of working on the margins of of, uh, European and American uh, film studios and trying to kind of finance stuff off the, you know, like cobbling together some kind of funding for whatever. And most of his really great work is not, you know, he could have done a lot more stuff had he, you know, kind of had some kind of consistent funding model. He looks a lot more like kind of a modern indie filmmaker in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, I think that, you know, having digital shooting ability and more importantly, digital editing capability where, you know, he really could kind of like dash out a quick edit and, you know, in a week, 
kind of give it to a professional editor to finish up and kind of move on to something else, I think he would have had a much more interesting career in the modern era. I think he would have been much more satisfied with the kinds of work he was able to do. And so in that case, it's it's really easy for me to bring back Wells because I would be really fascinated to see what, you know, sort of a modern adult Orson Wells would be able to do with, if he had like another 10 years to, to make films. I think he would, he would be fascinating in this modern market. And I mean, the, the idea that I don't get to watch the other films again, you know, I mean, it's sad, but it's also, you know, it's kind of less important to me than getting to see new work that Orson Welles would have made. Yeah. Okay, so with Wells, I got to say I'm not as in deep with his actual films he made compared to his, actually his acting jobs. Right. I think I like that work. This might be blasphemy, but I think I like a lot of that work a lot better. I do consider a, a few of his films real classics, but... I'm not I'm not the deep sort of Wells fanboy where I you know I'm kind of thirsting for new Wells movies necessarily. With Kubrick, yeah, he's he said all he needed to say, I think. That I, I agree with that estimation there. Hitchcock, basically same thing. <laughs> I mean, we'll still have Brian De Palma to make Hitchcock <laughs> films or Dario Argento. And, well, Hitchcock, and, uh, Hitchcock gets kind of enveloped in the culture to such a degree. I mean, it's less that, oh, he made all the films he wanted to make as much as he had a pretty enormously successful financial career. You know, mm-hmm. and the other three were much more sort of like artsy, you know, kind of working on the margins kinds of filmmakers, whereas Hitchcock was this deeply commercial guy, uh, mm-hmm. you know, maybe uh, slightly uh, less so kind of later on. But, you know, there's no sense in which Hitchcock, you know, was kind of, you know, working on the margins or was it able to kind of make the stuff he wanted to make? Yeah. And I mean, Hitchcock survived from the very beginning of film basically to the modern era. And so he, I mean, his influence is still going to be felt everywhere. It's it's not like you necessarily need to see a Hitchcock film to see a Hitchcock film. And in, in that, in that sort of right. sense, I have to go with Kurosawa though. Sure. Cause I, Kur- kind Kurosawa of, would definitely be my second choice, but I, I kind of feel like, he had more to say, and I kind of feel like the the start of his career, he, he had this very deeply humanist slant to a lot of his movies, and he got very cynical for a while, and a lot of his movies were very cynical and very, actually on the face, kind of depressing in a lot of ways. Uh, but as he sort of wound down his career and he was getting near his death, there was... You know, there was some sort of sense of the old Kurosawa coming back into some of his films, too. And I'd kind of like to see that continue. I'd kind of also like to see him and Toshiro Mifune make another film together. <laughs> so yeah. I kind of like their resurrect Toshiro Mifune as well, because they kind of reconcile, apparently, right near the end after yeah. being estranged for so many years. So, yeah, I got to go Kurosawa, and that, that feels weird considering the film we're going to be doing next time. I, I might have a totally different opinion after I watch it, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm going to stick with Kurosawa at, at this point. Yeah, no, I, I totally get that, and, I mean, Kurosawa is someone who definitely had, you know, he got cynical for a while, partly because he was having so much trouble getting stuff made, partly because of, you know, censorship within the Japanese film industry, and partly mm-hmm. because he was he was kind of seen as making films for Western audiences, because so many of his uh, influences were, were Western. Yeah. Um, and so uh, there, there is a, there is, a, you know, Kurosawa, it's, it's a very easy choice to pick Kurosawa, I think, you know, a very, not that I think that's an easy, like, yeah, not that I'm belittling your choice. It is a very, mm-hmm. you know, because he was the one I kind of automatically went to. Like, no, this is the guy I would I would most like to like kind of keep his stuff. But at the same time, I I don't know that. I don't know. For me, it's just easier to pick Wells, just because I feel like he got a little bit more. He there's less of his work that still exists that's kind of, you know, right. in a form that he would have been happy with. And uh, you know, I, I'm just more interested to see what you know Wells would have done today. Wells would have been my second choice but when i when i think of wells i'm i'm going under the assumption that there's no like magic theory that's going to change orson wells the person you know like he's, <laughs> right. he, he might still end up just being the same fucking guy who never finishes anything for the next sure years, right yeah so. no that, that's that's entirely possible but can you imagine the uh do you imagine the youtube presence that man would have <laughs> <laughs> well he already has a youtube presence well no i mean i'm just saying can you imagine like orson wells the youtube channel 
uh, where he's, uh, you know, just hanging out and like talking to camera and talking, you know, <laughs> sharing old stories from the glory days. You know, even if we don't get actual films from him, he would Orson Welles's Twitter would be lit, man. Let's just <laughs> <assist him. laughs> I just want to see him do more commercials for peas and wine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they bring him back. Michael Bay brings him back to do the voice of Optimus Prime in oh, the geez. Transformers sequel. Oh no, I mean if you're gonna if you're gonna bring him back, I mean you might as well just have him be Unicron again. Just do yeah. a do a movie of Unicron in it. Why not? Yeah, yeah. Why not? Why not? <laughs> He ends up becoming a voice actor as well. He's in all the uh, like the Justice League animated movies, and you know he's in like Rat Tattooey of Pat Oswalt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly, Mar- uh, what is his name? Maurice Lamarche just does not just just dies. Has no, no career, career anymore. He's like, well, I'm done. Eats a bullet. <laughs> I'm done. Orson Welles is back. <sighs> oh shit. And suddenly Orson Welles becomes known for his Maurice LaMarche impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> or they reboot Pinky in the Brain, and they're like, no, we got Orson Welles to do it now. We don't need you. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, fuck. Sorry. Sorry, Mr. LaMarche. <laughs> but have, you know have, that would happen. We have deep respect for you, Maurice LaMarche. I am, <laughs> I'm a deep lover of your work uh, over the decades. This is in no means meant to be a slight to you. I think he would even laugh at that joke, honestly. I think he um, would. <laughs> I, think, I think he knows. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to take a quick break. We're going to play some podcast promos and a little bit of music, and we're going to come back and talk about the last wave. You ungodly warlock. Howdy, folks. Got blood, violence, and freaks of nature. you come to the right place. My name is Gary, and I'm your guide to Cinema Beef Podcast. Every episode, we not only deliver film reviews, we also dismantle some of your favorite and most hated films, sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse. Hey, 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 you shut your face! If we want to hear you talk, I will shove my arm up your ass and work your mouth like a puppet. All right, calm down, calm down. Every show I hope to have a new co-host, podcasters, listeners alike. That's right, I'm talking to you people. I take all comers. Yo, slaps. That's not very nice. The only rules, well, let's ask the best cooler in the business. All you have to do is follow three simple rules. One, never underestimate your opponent. Expect the unexpected. Two, take it outside. Never start anything inside the bar unless it's absolutely necessary. And three, be nice. So join the insanity, and please, vent your frustrations. I'm available on TalkShoe, iTunes, and Stitcher Smart Radio. And remember, here at the Cinema Beef Podcast, if you got beef, I've got the grinder. Did you ever see a film at such a young age it left you traumatized with cinematic wounds? Ah, necrophilia. Ah, ah, ah. It's a dead issue, man. Don't, don't push it. Cinema PsyOps is a weekly podcast documenting an ongoing experiment on the mind of an unwilling test subject. No one should have to watch this movie. Oh, no one should have to watch this. No one should have to watch this movie. Surprisingly, it's not a topic that a lot of people really want to tackle. I'm shocked, prudes. I know, really. Right? It's the next sexual frontier that no one wants to explore. I am, in the most sincerest of senses, disappointed in you. It takes a powerful goddess like Connie, jam her arm down the monster's throat and kill it. I'm still tripping out over that. Even as a kid, I was like, I gotta find a girl like that. Every week, I I get a new look of disappointment that I never thought I could get out of. It's unimaginable. At 12 years old, you should not be watching this one. Obviously. At 13, you should not be. 14, you shouldn't be. I'm not entirely sure even 17-year-olds should be watching this. Just because you're offended by something doesn't mean that you have the right to demand that it doesn't exist. Watching this film again, I had all of this like little nerd glee with everything that kept little history doll popping up at you. So I totally loved this film. Hey, I know why you you know, couldn't see that. It's because your brain's warped watching this shit at twelve years old. Yeah, this is this is a rough movie. I told you ahead of time when we were getting ready to do it that it was. How did you watch movie. this shit at twelve? Because physical wounds heal, cinematic ones don't. Listen to Cinema Psyops. You ungodly warlock.
All right, the last wave from 1977. Hasn't the weather been strange? It could be a warning. I've been having bad dreams. Are you serious? Why didn't you tell me they were mysteries? This man had a dream. A forbidden vision that becomes a living nightmare. What are dreams? The way of knowing things. Dream is a shadow of something real. Why don't you go away? You'll die. I can't go away. The makers of Picnic at Hanging Rock bring a new dimension mystery and suspense. What's wrong? He was here, the old man. What are you saying? He was out there in the street. Oh. Why in the name of God are you helping us? You go to jail, all of you. You're in desperate trouble. No! You in trouble. You. You don't know what dreams are anymore. Deep beneath the city lies a secret guarded by primeval terrors beyond imagination. coming. Only one man can stop it. Your dreams will never be the same again. Directed by Peter Weir. Written by Peter Weir, Tony Morfitt, and Petru Popescu. Popescu? Popescu? Okay. Get on us, JW. What was I fucking up there? Richard Chamberlain as David Burton. Olivia Hamnett as Annie Burton. Uh, David Gallipoli. Gallipoli? Yeah, as Chris Lee. Fred I think Carl- it's Gopil. Gopil? Gopil? Okay. Gopil. Whatever. It, it's it's an aborigine name, so I, I'm, I think I'm entitled to fuck this up as a stupid white man. Fred Parslow as Reverend Burton. Uh, Vivian Gray as Dr. Whitburn. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Nanjiwara Amagula, Amagula as Charlie. Uh, Walter Amagula as Jerry Lee. Roy Barra as Larry. Cedric Lalara as Lindsay. Morris Lalara as Jacko. Uh, Peter Carroll as Michael Zedler. Anthal Compton as Billy Corman. Hedley Cullen as Judge. Michael Duffield as Andrew Porter and Wallace Eaton as Morgue Doctor. We do have an IMDb synopsis here, and I uh, tip my hat to the brave souls who try to make a synopsis for this film. This is this is from David Carroll, and he says, A Sydney lawyer who has more to worry about than higher than average rainfall when he's called upon to defend five aboriginals in court. Determined to break their silence and discover the truth behind the hidden society he suspects lives in his city, the lawyer is drawn further and more intimately into a prophecy that threatens a new Armageddon wherein all the continent shall drown. Yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad. I think throws away a lot of the uh, sort of supernatural, slightly mystical stuff that appears in this film, but uh, not bad. Not bad at all. Yeah, it's funny. So, it's funny the degree to which the the film, the, the, like any synopsis you read of the film, kind of argues backwards from like once you know the ending, you sort of like everything that's sort of leading up to that, but yet mm-hmm. you don't necessarily get that connection to sort of watching the film blind, right? Yeah. Like if, and, you were, if you were just to sit down and kind of write the stuff that happens in the film, 
the actual like underground city and the and the wave and everything is like the last ten minutes basically. You yeah, know? and then it's like, how much do you want to leave of that out because you don't want to spoil it at the same time when you're just doing a little brief synopsis of it. So. Well, and the film is called The Last Wave, which I thought this was going to be a surfing movie. I'm very disappointed. <laughs> there is some surfing in it, in, like the final there, shot. Yeah, there is, there is. <laughs> but yeah, so this is from Peter Weir, and uh, this is the I believe this is the first Peter Weir film we've done on this podcast. It, yeah, it, it is. is the first one we've done yes yeah i i'm familiar with some of his work like uh picnic and hanging rock yeah i'm, I'm just gonna let you start daniel what, what's your sort of initial thoughts on this yeah have you seen this before or is this the first time watch for you this is the first time watch uh i I'd, I'd known about it for a lot of years that's why i wanted to do it in the podcast and when someone basically is like could you guys do this i'm like yeah let's jump on this shit and then two years later we finally did <laughs> so. that's our that's our standard lag time i get that mm-hmm. yeah. um yeah, no, uh, first time watch for me as well. Um, I am also um, familiar with, uh, you know, about half of Weir's filmography. Um, obviously, The Truman Show. Uh, Dead Poets Society. Uh, Dead Poets Society, yeah. kind of his big, like, 80s and 90s American work. Um, Master and Commander is one that, right. I, that I quite like. Um, so, uh, But I don't know his early work very well at all. I have not seen Picnic at Hanging Rock, but now I'm very interested in seeing that. I feel like there's a weird kind of perception issue with me in this film that I'm kind of of two minds, depending on which way I want to look at this film as to how mm-hmm. I feel about it. Sorry, I'm being slightly uh, pedantic here. Um, uh, the film uh, on its face, and particularly in 1977, I think is pretty brilliant. I think it, it really is attempting to do something that few other films attempt. I think there is, a, it's very, it's very well acted. It's brilliantly mm-hmm. shot. The, you know, all the kind of technical merits of the film are the right there exactly where you want them to be. It's not even really worth discussing. It's kind of uniformly good across yeah. the board. I feel like for me, the big question that I kind of kept coming back to is how do they make this and how sort of, how do the people kind of in the film film feel about the way this is treated and sort of what's the, uh, perspective of the aboriginal people in terms of you know the way that this stuff is represented i did find a interview with peter weir talking about the making of the film which i guess you know apparently um he knew Golpil Golipil, Golpili. sorry let me look this up and just i, I feel like i <laughs> really do want to know his name i can't uh let's see because i've seen him in a million things too like he he's yeah. kind of like the aboriginal guy you get for your australian film you know right like, he, he's in he's in both cro- or the first two crocodile dundee films he's still mm-hmm. alive um he's got a, a nice wikipedia page which kind of summarizes him he's like a dancer i mean he's he was born so uh his name is go go pillow go pillow david we'll call him david <laughs> yeah <laughs> he was born in the, the tribal areas so the thing is that like David is a um, Aboriginal person who, you know, kind of had his foot in both societies, both in the sort of mm-hmm. like tribal society and, you know, kind of the modern Sydney or the modern, you know, kind of Europeanized society. Because of that, despite the fact that he was an actor, he was in Walkabout, the uh, Nicholas Rogue film. That yeah. was kind of where he get his name. And despite that, he... Uh, <laughs> kind of had this like weird way of talking and sometimes and like there were there were just these like that Peter Weir like cast him in some TV thing that he had done in the early 70s and they'd sit there and they'd talk and they you know and and occasionally David would just say something that was just dramatically made no sense to Peter Weir and yet like he would no this is obviously why don't you understand this and it's just there's something there's some kind of thing going on that like Weir got really fascinated by that and so Apparently, he really did the work to try to reach out to uh, people like the uh, like the uh, Nanjawara Amagula, who plays Charlie, mm-hmm. is an actual tribal leader. He's an actual clan right. leader. He uh, kind of like helps to handle disputes between kind of the Western, you know, authorities and kind of tribal authorities. And he he was kind of a go between. Apparently, you know, he did kind of reach out to you know people and kind of try to figure out who you know. He made every attempt to sort of be authentic to this, you know, to, to some degree, um, which makes me feel better about the film uh, because I was really worried this is going to be kind of like this kind of Western interloper kind of coming in and going like, Ooh, look at the spooky, mysterious stuff. And it's, yeah. 
there is something there is the, the fact that there is at least an attempt to kind of get some kind of authentic perspective and that, you know, those people were kind of brought in in the creative process to some degree does make me feel better about the film. And it does make me, you know, kind of I'm, I'm willing to kind of treat the film on its own merits. At the same time, it looks like they kind of made the film as a way of kind of exploring these ideas when I almost wish that a documentary about this kind of process would be a better way of kind of getting at some of this rather than sort of like fictionalizing it in this way. Yeah, and here's the biggest problem with with like this whole concept though, is that there are 900 apparently distinct tribal identities right. in the Aborigine culture. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and 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 yeah, no no kidding that there was trouble like trying to decipher like you know the anglicized conversation between the Aborigine actor and Peter Weir as well because. Apparently, there's so many dialects and like just weird English Aborigine hybrid dialects that exist right. in Australia. Yeah, it, it does. It does feel like a little bit like there is an attempt to kind of go out there, and they do get buy-in from the locals, at least in some sense, in terms mm-hmm. of like trying to make this. But at the same time, it does feel like there is. We're still leaving a lot on the table, and it does kind of end up being this kind of openly, uh, like, oh, it is just kind of this mysterious kind of cultural tribal thing that yeah. we Westerners are not given to understand that said i mean one of the things that you run into is like for instance they were trying to um kind of figure out like were there actual like kind of tribes that lived in the area that is now sydney and were there you know and it's like no all those people were decimated you know and so and there's no person alive who has any connection to those kinds of tribal artifacts and so it really is just kind of like guesswork as far Mm -hmm. as you know kind of what's really going on a lot of that stuff and i mean one thing that's just kind of worth throwing in here is you know, Australia, the Australian Aboriginal population is the kind of longest uh, kind of isolated population of people on the planet. The Australian outback was inhabited possibly as much as like 80,000 years ago. Yeah. Um, and like firm estimates go back like 50, 60,000 years. Um, I did do a little bit of kind of reading about human migrations is something that yeah. I have kind of a passing interest in due to other things that I kind of am interested in and sort of the history of sort of like Aboriginal and sort of tribal and, you know, kind of uh, archaeological cultures. You know, the fact that, you know, <laughs> people lived in Australia for something like 60,000 years before European colonization and then all those people just got annihilated. And yet there are large sections of of the, of the outback that are not uncontacted, not un- but, but kind of largely untouched. And uh, the film also really doesn't kind of get into the the real history of, you know, the absolute subjugation of the native peoples under right. the kind of um, thumb of the colonizers. And that, that really was still in place in 1975 when this <laughs> film was being made, right? Or 77 when the film was being made. So there, there is this kind of other lawyer character who has a couple of lines, you know, and kind of says, you know, oh, the, the tribal ways have died out. And I mean, it's kind of like, oh, we have this liberal guilt. And there's a lot of kind of back and forth that you can kind of get into with, with that. There's a lot of kind of nuance there. The film really doesn't explore any of that in any kind of way. I mean, it, I, I think it it does what it needs to do. And I think, again, it's hearts in the right place. So it's hard for me to feel too badly about it. Not that it's my place to kind of feel good or bad about this. You know, I'm not an, an, an Aboriginal person. I'm a very white <laughs> Europeanized Westernized person in myself. It does feel like we're in the, in the production kind of, kind of came at this in the right way and really made the attempt. And even in the interview where it says, you know, I, you know, do you think that, pe-, you know, he was asked, do you think that people that Western should try to uh, interact more you know, she tried to learn more from the natives. And he's like, there's really no way we spent a million dollars. I mean, basically we, this film cost a million dollars and we spent that as a way of kind of trying to explore that. I spent six weeks on it and, you know, you just, you, there's just no way of doing it without like trying to become one of them. And of course that's not really an option either. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of really complicated kind of political stuff that really is hinted at in this film that isn't that isn't really dealt with in a way that I would like it to be, but that I feel like, you know, kind of looking into the background, at least there is, there's an attempt to sort of like do it, do it in a realistic way and do it in a, in a thoughtful way. Um, and so I'm not going to really hold it too much against the film. And I think the film does work at its own terms, but I do, I am kind of continually just left with, you know, why are we following this bullshit murder story plot when, you know, the, the sort of the the relationship between these two characters is kind of more what this story should be about, you know, or these three characters, yeah. arguably, yeah. Um, because you could say that, you know, Charlie, uh, Chris and um, David are, are uh, lawyer, you know, this, they kind of form us kind of 
trio of people with kind of three different perspectives, and uh, but it kind well, of yeah. gets obscured in the in the narrative a bit. Yeah, Chris and David are kind of mirror images of them in in a way because they're mm-hmm. they're both two people sort of who become sucked into in between two different cultures, whereas Charlie is very much a traditional tribalist uh, like shaman character. Right. I can't fault Peter Weir here because I think he did the best he could with this. It's like. How far do you go trying to tackle, like... It, he goes as far as any reasonable human being could in terms of, of doing it. I mean, I guess the question is, you know, is this a thing worth doing more so than, you know... There's definitely, like, an interesting documentary that should be made, you know? Yeah. Um, but, I mean, as, as far as trying to make a commercial film that is sort of like a suspense, almost horror film kind of thing... He really goes much more farther on the let's talk about the tribal people side than he does let's talk about the white people side. So I oh, mean, yeah, yeah, no. the vast gulf of space uh, between white immigrant and settler cultures. You see, like the initial European settler culture here, and then you see immigrants in here, white immigrants, Italian immigrants in the car park. You know. Right, right. Um, the, the vast fucking gulf between understanding between these cultures and the Aborigines is, I think, meditated upon fairly well. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, I think my favorite quote from this film, and it's it's from David's wife, Annie. She says, I'm a fourth generation Australian, and I've never met an Aboriginal before. I think that's a pretty telling statement. Right. There, well, right? and then when, and then when um, Chris comes by and he brings uh, Charlie with him, yeah. He's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know he was, I didn't know there were going to be two of them. I mean, there is yeah. this kind of like, the, the, there are little digs at sort of that like subtle racism that's kind of mm-hmm. happening, you know. Um, and and again, this is this, this film does not, you know, it, it, it treats it, everyone as a is a nice kind of liberal, you know, like oh, we feel bad about the things that are going on, kind of thing. But it it definitely does not really kind of get at the the real horror of the system that was going on yeah, yeah. Um, even at that time. So, and I don't want to kind of keep coming back to that, but it is palpably absent from this, from this film. Yeah. Like it, it's, it's weird. Cause it, it depicts like <laughs> there's the uh, early on in the film where we have the, basically the, the sort of tribalistic murder of one of the Aborigines. It, it starts in a dead fucking authentic Irish pub in Australia <laughs> Right. With all these white people just playing Irish music and shit, and then this shit happens. Yeah, it, it's it's so weird just to see like there's there's a big disconnect there. They sort of play upon this idea that you you were talking about the the other attorney who says, um, oh, there's there's no tribal culture in the cities. Like they're they're all basically right. just they're basically just the Aborigine version of white trash, you know. And then the movie well, makes the, this- the argument. The argument goes like if they're if they're actually tribal people then they can kind of be governed under tribal law. And we have mm-hmm. like exceptions where we just kind of allow the tribes to kind of govern themselves in this way. But if they're city folk, if they're, if they're in our culture, then we have to treat them under like our law. Yeah. Which... And, and they're ignoring what this sort of film posits in, in sort of the horror film sort of sure. undertone of this, of the reality of the dream time and how that their religion is actually real. And there's, there's weird shit going on that white people can't understand because they choose to ignore it. Basically they, they basically ignore the fact that in, in reality, the white people have basically lost their connection to their past as, whereas uh, this is sort sort of concept of the dream time. And I did some reading on this. I'm still kind of, confused by it because it's a weird concept and and actually the dream time sort of moniker for it was i think made up by a white man it was like to yeah. try to, to try to explain this shit but sort of the idea that an individual's entire ancestry kind of exists as one sort of all and culminating uh, idea of worldly knowledge and your, your ancestors exist in the dream time and they are the ones who give you knowledge of the future and everything like it's kind of this like circular kind of thing things that happen in dream time will either happen in the real world or, or have already happened and will happen again. At one point, uh, David is talking to uh, Chris and Chris tells him, you don't know how to dream anymore. Basically. He's basically saying you white people don't know how to dream anymore. So you've lost a connection to 
the truth of your culture and the truth of your existence kind of thing. Whereas the Aborigines still have that connection in the dream time where they know basically everything <laughs> like uh, right. the character, the character of Chris, it, it's interesting. He, he basically knows everything in this film. Like he knows what's going to happen. And he's just either sadly disappointed by every time David kind of fails to understand. It, it, it's hard to interpret. Like I'm, I'm just like shooting blanks here. Kind of. Yeah, like there, there's, the there's a, it, it does feel like there is, it reminds me a lot of uh, the kind of the conversation we had around Ganjan S in mm-hmm. the sense that there is something that's like kind of deeply personal to the individuals making the film that is kind of on display here. And I mean, it does feel like that this film is Peter Weir kind of working out in a sense, the sort of guilt about sort of being part of a settler colonialist empire right. that is, you know, absolutely destroyed every other culture on the planet and, you know, pursuit of, you know, mindless profit. And, you yeah. know, like um, there is this sense. And uh, I mean, I think one of the things that the film really kind of gets across, and I, I think we should talk about the film, you know, kind of its merits on its own here. But I think one of the things that the film really does get across is this idea that, you know, these sort of European, you know, this kind of Western culture is this kind of transplanted thing. Right. that is really kind of sitting on the top of this soap scum of this kind of ancient thing that has kind of pre-existed that has been destroyed by the Europeans, but that still kind of exists in some vestigial form. They're, they're really, I mean, there's something Lovecraftian about that, you know, like Lovecraftian yeah. in sort of the, the kind of original sense, sort of the, the sort of the basic idea that, you know, these tribal cultures, that they know things that we don't, that they have this kind of dark past and there is yeah you know whereas lovecraft comes at it from a much more kind of like explicitly racist kind of mm-hmm. you know, perspective i think this film really you know any kind of you know kind of inbuilt racist that you know stuff is much more benign i mean it is kind of much more kind of treating the uh, the natives as kind of magical characters which is problematic in its own way but it does you know like uh chris gets angry a couple of times and mm-hmm. I mean, you know, there, there's not a sense of sort of a like, oh, this is this magic saintly character. I mean, they're still these these guys are still treated as people. You know, they are right. photographed as people. They are treated as, you know, kind of human beings living in this society. I think there's a lot to say to be said for for that sort of approach well, at least. Well, yeah, the, the the whole reason Chris and his friends shut up about all this stuff and don't want to testify in their murder trial and all and all that is because they're they're trying <laughs> In in a way, they're trying to protect the white people from the apocalypse. It, it right. Seems like like it, it, there's there's sort of that notion there. Like let's not let the white people discover this because if they discover this, bad things are going to happen. <laughs> right. And, and I mean, that's kind of David's story of maybe knowing too much, and and that goes back to the sort of Lovecraft thing too. It's where a, a, someone. Kn- learns too much that he shouldn't have learned. And I mean, they make some talk of uh, David being like uh, the representation of some sort of spirits that came to Australia years ago or whatever, you know, like there's, there's all kinds of weird sort of uh, Aborigine religious stuff in this that it all doesn't quite hit, but it makes for an interesting kind of mishmash. Like it it just keeps you thinking like, wow, this is weird. And this is interesting. And man, I, I do like this a lot. I like it a lot. And and Peter Weir, Picnic and Hanging Rock, did not give any answers, really. And this film doesn't really give any answers, either. It it, it, it kind of leaves you in this uh, kind of sense of this, this morass of, of stuff that's happened and this kind of hints at, the, at this larger world, but it, it, it literally ends on a on something that may be real and maybe a vision or maybe, you right. know, who, you know, and, and um, Again, it's a film that kind of works on that kind of emotional level. It works on, you know, comes with kind of following uh, David's journey as he as he kind of explores this. Um, there is something kind of inherently uh, iffy in the idea that, like, oh, it turns out this white European man is the actual reincarnation of this, you know, ancient deity slash spirit slash whatever. Yeah, you but know. At, the, at the same time, though, um, he fails the Aborigines, though, because mm-hmm. as he escapes the underground ruins or whatever, he loses all the ancient artifacts as he goes, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So there, there's kind of a prophetic thing there as well that he's going to basically fail them and fail himself. I mean, there's a sense that there's this thing. I mean, you know, there's this early sequence, which I think is one of my favorite little moments in the film and really kind of sells the, the sort of this 
horror movie aesthetic that's kind of playing underneath this. Um, it's very easy to just see this as a as a horror film. Yeah. In terms of the way it's shot, in terms of the way it's edited, in terms of the way it's performed and written. And there's this really great sequence where the uh, Richard Chamberlain who uh, who plays David is uh, kind of having dinner with his with his wife and two I guess two daughters. Mm-hmm. And uh, it turns out that uh, there's water kind of dripping down yeah. the stairs. And then you know, you go up and it's like oh the the um, spout was uh, clogged the, uh, the the drain was clogged with with toys things were turned and um, so suddenly we're you know we're just overflowing a bathtub and uh, it's like well nobody seems to have done it nobody cl- you know kind of claims it fesses up to it and you know we're just kind of left with this you know wow how did this happen but um, and again Weir kind of talks about it in this uh, interview he kind of mentions you know. You know, you think about, we think we have these, like, forces under control. We think that, like, oh, I have, you know, I have a pipe that I just turn a thing, and then water comes in, and I can right. you know, turn. But what if what if the pipe was open, and I couldn't turn it off, and no plumber could turn it off? And we just got flooded with, with water, you know, and there is this kind of sense that in this world that we think we understand, and yet there are these kind of forces that ultimately any ordinary person just kind of walk, doesn't has no idea like how the water gets through the pipe to you. You just know you turn the thing on and water shows up, you know? And so you're kind of victim of this kind of larger, it doesn't even have to be necessarily a natural thing, but you're this kind of victim of this larger kind of superstructure, which is kind of making your life, your comfortable life possible, but that could very easily kind of rise up and destroy you. Basically the white man's ignorance of the land they're living on, you know, like Mm -hmm. another one of those uh, instances, this is much more minor is David is a tax lawyer, but somehow (laughs) he gets this murder case and there's no real explanation for it. It's just a circumstances move him to be someone basically is like, can you do this case for me? Like kind of thing. And, and you, and you feel like, there's some sort of outside forces pushing him to this position. It's just weird because, like, there's no actual real explanation for it. It's like, why the fuck would you put a tax lawyer into a, a murder trial with Aborigines? Like, it, it doesn't make sense at all. But he's this white, middle-class, comfortable guy who, like you like you mentioned, he doesn't ask those questions. It's like, yeah, you turn the tap, the water comes out. And you turn it off, and the water stops. He, he's that guy. And but he quickly sort of descends into this world where it's, that might not be real. This this dream time stuff. This might be the real reality of my existence, and he gets lost in it. Like he he just descends into it. Uh, I'm kind of thankful that he actually sends his wife and kids away from yeah. it, from it because it, it it feels like in a much darker movie they just he he'd come back to his house and find them like drowned in the pool or something. Yeah, or you know, like the like dark elemental forces would come would come around and you know eat them or whatever, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, it it does. I mean, I think you could even classify this as a horror movie in a lot of ways. Um, it, it 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 is to a certain extent, and I and I think the, one of the strengths of this movie is that you can interpret it as a horror movie, but you can also interpret it as more of like a psychological thriller where David might just be you, you can't trust what he's seeing. Like he might be, yeah. a, you know, he might be going nuts. Yeah, so. there, he he could just be kind of like falling into some some version of madness that you know yeah. is uh, yeah sort of validated by the people around him or something. Right. Um, you know, I kind of see it as is uh, kind of a meditation on this concept more so than that's know, sort of a, that's kind of where I fall upon it. Yeah, it's, it's, but it's, but it definitely kind of borrows its structure. I mean, it isn't really like about the murder trial. I, or, no, it's really a manslaughter trial. I mean, that nobody's kind of claiming that this is like premeditated murder. It's uh, you know, like I mean, basically, like yeah, they get sent up for six months and then they go back to their tribe and it's fine. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the the conceit here is that uh, no one can prove actual murder, even though they make it a homicide investigation. It's more that, you know, the guy who died, he was found with water in his lungs and he fell in the puddle. They chased him into the puddle, so you can kind of argue manslaughter or whatever. But as you watch the movie, of course, the Charlie character waves a bone at the guy or whatever and does like basically a ritual magic assassination kind of thing. But, uh, you know, if you choose to believe that, I mean, the movie leaves that so much open to interpretation of what you want to choose is actually going on. So, I mean, it, it just opens up the ending even more. It's what is really going on, you know? Right. And I, th- and I think the ambiguity is one of the strengths of the film that we're yeah. not. Like, I mean, 
I think we're kind of led to um, believe that there is some validity to this concept that uh, I mean to I mean to the very real history that like Europeans just decimated all the natives, like, right. you know, ultimately. But I think we are also kind of led to a certain uh, ambiguity about whether this whether that can be real and like the dream time can be bullshit. Right. You know, yeah. like, um, I think the film does kind of present the dream time is in some sense, uh, real because there is sort of validity of terms of, uh, you know, because they seem to kind of know the dream and like he sort of see symbols that have, um, kind of, you know, kind of cross cultural understanding or at least sort of mm-hmm. cross character understanding and that sort of thing. So I don't think the film quite kind of is like, well, who knows? Maybe it is just kind of all, nonsense or whatever um it does take the concept of dream time seriously enough to sort of like interrogate it but i think there is a sort of a sense in which and we could kind of come out of this you know with a, with a much more kind of materialist explanation if we if we chose to yeah but, it, but it, i don't it, think that's intended by the filmmaker i think that's you know we'd have to kind of force it into that yeah no it it, it does uh, it gives you dream time but it doesn't tell you exactly what it has to be it, it yeah. doesn't tell you what you have to believe about it so i mean it's still open to interpretation at that point. It's like, and I mean, if you read about dream time, <laughs> it's just another, it's just another backwards kind of religious belief that is so open to an interpretation. And uh, again, 900 distinct cultural well, identities well, in Australia. I, I mean, just, I, I did, I did a little bit of research into the uh, individuals in the film mm-hmm. more so than the, uh, I did not like read about Dreamtime. So the the actor um, Gopili, Gop, Gopalil, Gopalil, mm-hmm. I keep mispronouncing that. He is Yalungu man of a certain kind of speech of, of a certain kind of language. Well, if you click on that language in Wikipedia, sorry, there's a. Uh, it turns out like if you kind of go and you look into this, there's Western linguists who study like these language families mm-hmm. can't even decide how many like sub dialects there are. Right. Because, like, the whole concepts that we use in sort of, like, linguistics to, like, classify these things break down in terms of, like, understanding the divisions between these different kinds of modes of speech. Mm -hmm. So these are people who literally lived in this kind of large area, semi-isolated, for 50,000 years. Yeah. Yeah. 50,000 years. Yeah, a lot of these tribes were isolated from each other. I mean, Australia well, and over and over this vast amount of time. Like, if you if I, again, I kind of looked at um, kind of the history of Aboriginal people in, in Australia. You look at that web page. There are estimates that there may have been as many as one point six billion human beings who lived and died on the Australian subcontinent during the period during that fifty thousand years or so. Yeah. And you know that's 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 amazing. That's massive. That's that's so much of the, like the history of the human species. And I mean, I, I think this is what, and and this is what I'm taking from the film, which you know is not necessarily. I mean, it's great that the film kind of inspires this. Is like it, it does make me kind of think about this kind of long, deep history that not just uh, Australia has, but the entire world has this right. history. And you know, we we kind of think that our history begins something like three thousand years ago. I mean. You know, even sort of like the advent of agriculture, again, you know, kind of mass agriculture, like, you know, 5,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. That's kind of where, like, written history begins. And written history is literally like, well, we needed a way to kind of, like, keep track of grain. And we needed <laughs> a way to you know, write down all the ways that the slaves were going to be tortured. And, like, right. 99.9% of people were essentially agricultural slaves. And uh, we've lost this thing, which is this kind of connection to, like, a either a hunter gatherer or a, you know, cap pastoralist, you know, kind of, kind of tradition, you know, which is not to say that like, I kind of like living in my Western society with air conditioning and movies and, you know, yeah. uh, you know, but at the same time, there is this kind of sense that, you know, we, we in this kind of Western tradition, which again, the European, like what we think of as like traditional European value are like 400 years old, basically, you know? Yeah. And, you know, we think that this, you know, we kind of look back and we read this long, history like oh this is just how people always have been because you know now it's all biology and you know this is just kind of the way that the way that things are 
And no, it's not. It's really, really not. You know, I mean, the Irish were like essentially a tribal people Mm -hmm. up until the 17th century living. I mean, you know, obviously there are vast differences in terms of, you know, geography and like the, the details of it. And I would not want to make direct comparison, but the idea that this is in some way, um, <laughs> the idea that like Europeans are, are in some way you know, like superior, that there is some, you the, know. Like, yeah. Kind of, the, the idea of a concrete nationality is absolute bullshit. Exactly. Exactly. And I think the real thing that the film is, is reaching for and the thing that I'm kind of getting from it and what I'm kind of struggling to articulate maybe is that the film expresses about as well as anything that I've seen in kind of a narrative feature, the inadequacy of kind of coping with this idea of deep time in terms of right. our own history. And it makes this guy, this kind of ordinary, kind of a chud. I mean, kind of like this kind of nothing blank of a character. I mean, not that not that he seems like an evil man. I mean, he's a good no, man. No, he's, he's a yuppie. But, is what but he he's, is. Just, he's just this kind of guy. I mean, he's yeah. just, you know, he's just, you know, he's like, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, he's kind of asked to confront, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of kind of human history and this this kind of deep thing that we don't, normally think about in terms of our kind of day-to-day existence and i mean that's the thing that sort of drives him to these extremes as much as anything you know and that's that's a fascinating kind of vision right you know yeah he's this milk toast white dude asked to confront the idea that he might possibly there be the reincarnation of these spirits that visited australia like hundreds of thousands of years ago right. and, and changed aborigine col- culture and he has to live up to the expectations of that and it's like okay maybe we might want to stop for a minute and think about that shit. And, and the way he does that is he puts on his barrister wig and goes maybe this bone does have magic powers you know? <laughs> you know? I do like this film a lot. I'm not going to sit here and pretend I fully understand it. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to rewatch this quite if a bit. Nothing, if nothing else, it's astonishing in some of the things it shows us. And in yeah. uh, the cinematography, the, 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 the filming, uh, the performances are great all the way around. I mean, everybody is completely believable in their role. Mm-hmm. I mean, we haven't really talked about like Richard Chamberlain. I think Richard Chamberlain, he sells this very, very well. And I mean, there is a sort of like flatness, like an affect, uh, affectlessness to his performance. Uh, but I think it works in the context of the film in terms of he, he is this kind of blank that, you know, this kind of representation of this kind of generic Europeanness that is, you know, but, confronting yeah, but, this. But at the end of the film, though, where he's in those tunnels, he goes. He goes emotional and big too. Yeah. Like he and and, and he basically earns it, right? once, once he gets his once he gets his uh, shirt dirty, you know, because mm. he crawls through that pipe and then like once he, <laughs> then, you know, like, he gets filthy and then suddenly it's like oh now now I get he he sort of and understands things on a different level. Right? I, I like that there's a book in there too because at the opening of the film you have that uh, Aboriginal in the trench coat who's escaping the tunnels and then you mm-hmm. see him doing it at the end of the film. Right. With his trench coat. Yeah, I think the performances are good. I think the sound design on this film is fucking amazing. It oh, won yeah. awards. I think it was like the Australian Academy Awards, basically, they won sound design for. It reminded me of those YouTube videos you can pop up of 10 hours of lightning storms. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Easier, easy into sleep and shit, you know? You're always hearing either rain or wind or just a combination of both. And you know oh, you have the, the presence other- of nature in this film, the presence, mm-hmm. just the presence of the rain, and um, you know the, very early. I mean, like one of the first things in the film is like you're you're kind of in the middle of the the outback, this desert, you know, without a cloud in the sky, and then suddenly it starts hailing, like and there's still no clouds, of ice, and there's yeah. still no clouds, you know, and and so there is a sense that there is some strange weather thing, and you even get there's a, there's kind of like a talk radio guy kind of talking about oh it's the pollution and you know all that sort of thing. Yeah, and, you have you have a couple talk radio like scientific explanations and this bullshitters. Here's what it is, and at one point you have this uh, appearance of all these little toads all of a sudden dropping in the rain. Really good stuff. Like it, it really sort of builds on that sort of premonition supernatural aspect. Uh, Weir sort of goes in and out of that very well and balances it. And uh, I, I think this is a great film. Uh, I'm going to revisit it a couple times and sort of solidify my thoughts on it. But as of right now, as it stands for me, I like it a lot. I think it's worth seeking out. Absolutely. I would definitely recommend the film. I don't think it, I, I think my issues with it kind of extend further than the film itself. 
mm-hmm. in kind of a complicated way in ways that I've, I've tried to articulate here, um, which kind of prevent me from really kind of loving it. But it definitely is worth seeking out. It is worth a, it is worth a watch. Um, it is available. Uh, you can stream it on Amazon for, I think, like a $4 rental or something. Nice. So um, definitely worth that. And the print looks great. So, you know, no worries yeah. there. You get a Rare Lust, uh, of course, and Criterion Collection 2001 DVD apparently is the best version you can get right now. No Blu-ray, as far as I can tell. So, Do you know if there are like, like commentaries and stuff? Did you look into the special features? I didn't. I did not I, get into that. I feel that. like that's the thing. I really want to like listen to people talk about this. Film. Yeah. I, you sure. know, I, and I'll give you a link to this uh, interview so you can put it in the show notes. But, Sweet. Um, you know, uh, it's not a long interview, but it is from... 79 from the time of the American release of the film. And so uh, getting kind of a contemporaneous kind of look at like people kind of asking these questions was really useful for me in terms of kind of like uh, kind of getting at what Weir was really kind of going at at that that time. But I'd be fascinated to hear him talk today. I'd really want to hear from um, David Gulkalu. Yeah. Um, what he has to say about how this film was made. I couldn't find him. I couldn't find anything of him kind of like talking about it, but uh it would be it would be really fascinating. Um, apparently, the other guy I can pronounce it if I can look at it, <laughs> Nanjuwara Amagula. Apparently, he uh, died in the mid eighties. So, oh shit! You know, oh, yeah, well, yeah, um, he's pretty old at this point. So yeah. yeah, he was pretty old, but I mean, he he was he was a well respected guy. He's um, if you kind of Google his name, he comes up. He he has a, a kind of a, a long kind of resume as someone who kind of worked to to moderate these issues between the tribe and the kind of Western government, and uh, you know, kind of fighting for indigenous people's rights. And from my guess, he's probably a really phenomenal human being. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. It's just kind of you very rarely kind of run into that. Where I'm watching this uh, this kind of like kind of vaguely horror film, and go like, well, that guy's probably just astonishing as a human. You know, <laughs> that guy's fought more than like I will ever fight in my life for you right. know like a tiny scrap of land for you know someone that I wouldn't even know if I passed on the street. It's it's amazing, you know. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> yeah, budget for this was eight hundred and eighteen thousand Australian dollars, and a box office was one point two million in the USA <laughs> and eight hundred and sixty six thousand in. Australia, so did all right. Apparently, this was not, that. yeah. Apparently, this wasn't as big a success as Picnic at Hanging Rock was for Peter Weir, but still a success, mild success anyway. And I mean, the guy went on to be, you know, a big Hollywood director for a while. So yeah, uh, yeah so yeah. You, you can't poo poo that. Couple little trivia notes here. The city of Adelaide, double for the city of Sydney in this movie. During production, Sydney experienced harsh weather conditions with constant (laughs) heavy rain. Such weather ironically had to be recreated in Adelaide, which was sunny and pleasant during filming. (laughs) So there you go. You know, if you're if you're shooting this film and you're like looking at the uh, weather reports out of Sydney, you might think, you know. Do we do we happen upon something here? Are we are we actually <laughs> going to get this apocalyptic wave? I think maybe it's going to happen. Peter Weir goes crazy and starts wringing the necks of, of the Aboriginals. What do you know? What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, there's like there's one moment outside the court, you know, when he's about to kind of interview Chris uh, or uh, you know put him on the stand, and I mean he's fairly aggressive. Like I mean he's grabbing his arm and like shaking him and like he's getting quite basically frustrated, yeah. he's threatening him. You know is is you know you better fucking answer. Uh, it's it's kind of a harsh moment. It really, uh, but but I mean it does kind of speak to the uh, the characters. You know kind of where he is emotionally in that moment. So you know yeah. So I just throw it in there. I think I, it's it's a uh, yeah. There's a lot in this film. I I definitely need to revisit it. I think you know it's 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 tough to kind of get everything this film has got going for it in a single viewing. But, uh, right. One interesting note I, I picked up here that I, I thought was quite fun. Chris is seen wearing a hat decorated with a small silver pin in the shape of an airplane. This identifies him as a member or believer in a cargo cult. Hmm. In which displaying a tiny plane summons an actual transport plane from England, which then distributes valuable objects, cargo, to the natives. And I, I thought that was kind of fun. Like, well, it, it's it's not fun. It's historically it's horrific and weird but just putting that in the movie even even if he's not an actual believer in cargo cults just right. like that's kind of the region of the world where car- cargo cult thing kind of happens a lot like the philippines yeah. and stuff like that oh, yeah. too, right 
Yeah, so, no, I mean, the cargo cult concept, I mean, it's interesting how, like, it's got a lot of different nuances to it. There's a sort of thing where it becomes, like, this kind of racist thing towards, you know, because there were these kind of cargo cults, but they seem to have been kind of, like, isolated to this kind of particular, like, kind of place and time. Right. And kind of, like, integrating this, you know, sort of reality of the Native people's lives and of, of these kind of Europeans coming along and, like, destroying everything they had. <laughs> And uh, they were they were kind of trying to kind of interpret this drastic change in their life, and then like the word cargo cult becomes you know this like oh just this weird superstition that people had annihilating this real history of this kind of lived experience and like you know so the very concept of a cargo cult now becomes this kind of complicated. Well, yeah, the idea of people living in that sort of region, like the Pacific region, like this mm-hmm. is rim in that where the cargo cult thing was most prevalent. And if you're wearing, like, a cargo cult pin, quote-unquote, <clears throat> are you basically just participating in, like, the pop culture idea? Right, of like cult. a version of, of how the Western people see you or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's complicated. I, I, I missed that detail, but yeah, no, that's... Yeah, there's a lot in this film. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot going on. Daniel, you are taking over the programming of They Must Be Destroyed on site for the next little while, until the end of the yeah. year. Yeah. So please... My, please my apologies me. to the audience, yeah. yeah. So tell us, what are we doing next time? Yeah, we're going to do an Orson Welles film that I've been waiting 20 years to see. <laughs> and that has, uh, you know, so, so Orson Welles died in 1986 with an unfinished film, the other side of the wind that um, he had not had the money and the, you know, the, the ability to finish due to kind of rights issues and sort of, you know, it kind of has has spent, I first read about this in like his, his biography citizen Wells, uh, which I read in, you know, the late nineties at some point. And, uh, you know, kind of talking about this film and some footage of it has kind of been circulating around on the internet and some documentaries and there was like kind of like 16 minutes of it that, you know, kind of surfaced at some point. And it's just very trippy. Like if you think about Orson Welles and all you know is Citizen Kane and then like a couple of black and whites or whatever, Orson Welles got super crazy trippy in the, yeah. uh, later in his life. And this looks to be that. I have not watched it yet. Once I saw it, because the thing is, it's been released. It is now on Netflix and we're going to do some Orson Welles films. So next week we're going to do The Other Side of the Wind. And I will finally get to see this thing. I've been literally waiting 20 years to get to see. <laughs> and we will talk about it. Wells is a fascinating figure, uh, in part for me, just because he does get kind of seen as this kind of kind of old-timey black and white director. But mm-hmm. if you know his later work at all, I mean, he's this fascinating kind of mercurial figure. And he kept up with the times, but he did it in, like, his own kind of weird, fucked-up way. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Um, yeah, this, this is going to be fun. Uh, this is going to be an adventure for me because, um, again, like I said early on in the uh, initial segment of the show, I I have never done like a super deep dive nerdy kind of thing with Orson Welles. I've always been uh, much more on the sort of the uh, peripheral with him, uh, mm-hmm. sort of like looking at his performances and, and liking a couple of his movies. So that should be a really good episode. And I think we'll have a lot to talk about with that episode. Yeah. I mean, Jesus Christ has got John Huston playing like a Ernest John Huston Hemingway kind of playing, playing Ernest Hemingway as Wells. Yeah. essentially you know um yeah so so this yeah was, a, re- a return to john houston for this podcast as well you know? yeah and i'm also super excited because this film also has cameron mitchell in it i'm i'm fucking i'm nice. elated i love yeah cameron no mitchell. i have not i have not kind of looked into it and uh oh yeah kodar oh yeah kodar is in it mm-hmm. was, uh, actually the, bunch, actually you know? this this entire cast is fucking insane like oh yeah no there there's <laughs> there's a, this is this is going to be a fun i have had to actively fight myself to not sit and just watch this film right now so uh you know for the last like two weeks or so since it since it uh, showed up on netflix so we're definitely going to do that next week and hopefully it lives up to the to the memory but that's what we're going to start there we're probably going to do at least one other wells film kind of you know before Sweet. the end of the year and uh i'll just you know if you want me to pick films i can pick films that's your uh, job. I think we're, we're going to alternate. I think we're going to do some some headier stuff, and we're going to do some more kind of fun, goofy stuff. I kind of like the idea of like alternating like '80s action and like art films. That's sort of my strategy. It's all, it's all up to you. You're programming the show for the next right. year, so that's yeah, all we're so, doing. So you know, and for Christmas, everybody gets the gift of me not being in charge anymore. That's the you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Happy New Year! So, uh, Daniel, where can people find you on their webs? Well, you can find me uh, on Twitter at Daniel Lee Harper if you want to come and uh, kind of check out what I'm doing. Uh, a podcast I recorded last night, 
I spent most of today editing that, doing the first half of it anyway. And it is a political discussion of, uh, you know, kind of Donald Trump and the kind of midterm results. Uh, and that's on the Wrong With Authority feed. And you can find that at uh, warmwithauthority.blogspot.com. And uh, I'm sure Lee will put a link to that yes. in the uh, show notes. Uh, because the uh, the most recent episode, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. The first half of that is kind of more kind of, current events and then the second half kind of goes much more big picture and that i have not finished editing yet but the the first half is up now so go check that out if you want to listen to me and well i'd say three british men but uh, james kind of dropped out pretty quickly because his connection was shit and so he just he has like a few things to say and then just kind of disappears from the podcast um (laughs) so uh but myself and uh the other wrong with authority guys uh we we had a nice we had a very cathartic experience discussing the news it was it was a really fun thing and i think the uh, the finished episode is good so go check that out if you want to listen to me talk about donald trump for a while nice wrong authority is always good you can find us at tmbdos.podbean.com where you can find our apple Podcasts, youtube and facebook links join our facebook group they must be destroyed on site on facebook and you can find out about what's coming up on the podcast. Exclusive. You can you can find out. You don't have to pay the Patreon money or anything like that. No, uh, no. You, you just you just get it right there. And if you and if you leave questions on the uh, Facebook page, we'll answer them on the show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you so look at our last, you can, you can participate. Yeah, you look at but our previous episode. Turns out if you leave any comment anywhere that Lee can see it. We'll talk about it, even Pretty if it's much. just calling us assholes. We'll, yeah, we'll, I mean, you know, get on our MySpace page and start leaving <laughs> our fucking comments, and we'll, we'll jump on that. You uh, know, MySpace it, still exists. It does, and it's like, and it's complete, and it's just because MySpace started off as like a band page, you know, like mm-hmm. where if you had a band, you could like upload your songs and shit, and then it became like this, like the the nascent social media thing that everybody was on for 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 a brief second. And then afterwards, it just kind of went back. I think it's now like part of Yahoo or something. But yeah. Now it's just like a band page again. Like it's just it's just bands now. And it's like, look at look at that. Like I'm actually <laughs> kind of really proud of MySpace that they kind of they went back to their roots roots and they're still around. Like ten years later, it's great. They they found themselves again, boys and girls. Yeah, yeah. They're, you know they're 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 the, the the OG of social media and they're yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for the big ICQ comeback. No, that'd yeah, be great. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh but yeah, thank you everyone for listening. Uh, thank you for joining me, Daniel. And we're gonna be back with some fucking Orson Wells. We're gonna we're gonna get deep. We're gonna get serious again and, and really start yeah. talking about shit. And uh yeah, until then, see you guys later. Bye bye. Cheers.
You've been listening to They Must Be Destroyed on Sight. For other episodes, our Apple Podcast, YouTube, and Facebook group links, as well as podcasts and websites of similar interest, please visit us at tmbdos.podbean.com. Thank you. Drive through. <laughs>